is there a role for immunotherapy in thyroid cancer with Dr. Brian Haugen? So welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Angelique Ford Davis. I'm a volunteer wow. with Thyca and also a thyroid cancer survivor. And yeah. I'm here with Abby Melendez. Melendez, also a thyroid cancer survivor. Oh, and our guest speaker, Dr. Haugen. Dr. Haugen. <laughs> And Dr. Brian Haugen is an endocrinologist at the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center in Denver, Colorado. Dr. Haugen is a professor of medicine and pathology, as well as head division of endocrinology and Meta metabolism and diabetes and chair of endocrine neoplasms research. Dr. Haugen's clinical research interests focus on thyroid cancer, including molecular therapeutic targets, Specific areas of research included nuclear hormone receptors, RXR, TR, PPAR, and kinase signaling pathways as therapeutic targets in thyroid cancer, as well as proteomic approaches to molecular markers in thyroid neoplasms. He presented a FICA webinar on thyrogen in September 2012, available on FICA's website. Dr. Haugen is a past president of the American Thyroid Association and a FICA medical advisor. Welcome, Dr. Haugen. Great. Thank you, Anjali and Abby, for uh, moderating this session. And again, thanks to the Thyroid Cancer Survivors Group for uh, having me speak. And obviously, again, for the great work that everybody does, it, it really is a wonderful partnership that we uh, physicians and other professionals take, you know, helping patients with this. Uh, have with uh, with FICA. So this is a really great partnership. And I, uh, I again, thank you for doing this um, important work. Um, today, I'm going to talk about immunotherapy. And I've changed the title just a little bit. In the immunotherapy first, how does it work? And the second question is, does it work for thyroid cancer patients? And hopefully we'll have somewhat, I won't have a perfect answer for you at the end, but we'll have somewhat of an answer um, at the end. So what I'd like to do is start with a timeline. Um, of what we call uh, disruptive therapies in oncology. And this was this really nice paper published in 2020. And if you look back here at the beginning, one of the first disruptive therapies in oncology, all of oncology, not just thyroid, was surgery, because you could cut the tumor out. And that was really kind of really took off and got much better. I mean, you, you could look back to ancient Egyptian times and they were doing things like breast cancer surgery, but really took off in the mid 1800s. And about 50 years later, external radiation therapy took off. Um, so that's another, another big kind of 50 year later disruptive uh, therapy in oncology. And then we had the chemotherapy, typically the cytotoxic chemotherapy that killed fast growing cells about another 50 years later. And then another 50 years later, we had what I talked about just in the last hour was targeted therapies where we're getting more specific on what we're hitting, not just fast growing cells, but hopefully the cancer cells themselves. And then we really took another leap forward fairly quickly, only 16 years later with cancer immunotherapy. But you can see cancer immunotherapy, even though I think we know a lot about it and stuff, it's not been around that long as a therapy. But I like kind of history stuff. When I say it's not been around a long, actually the first cancer immunotherapy that many of us could find was in actually in the late 1800s. Um, and so it's been about 121 years between the very beginning of cancer immunotherapy testing and when we're really using it regularly in practice uh, with other cancers, not as much yet with thyroid, but we're getting there. So it's been a long time from when it started to when we kind of have good therapy. So one of the first, and this was a New York Times article in 1908, um, Dr. William Bradley Coley um, did some work with what's called Coley's toxins. So what they did there was they took some bacteria, killed them, and injected them into people with cancer to see if they could whip up their immune systems to kill their cancer. And they show this young gentleman here way back then who had this really nasty tumor on his face that involved the bone, it's a soft tissue tumor. And you can see, I don't know if it's Dr. Coley himself or someone else with these hypodermic needles and big needles and all that stuff, giving him this injection. And they gave him multiple injections over a period of time. And he really had some resolution of that tumor um, with that. Um, so that really was kind of one of the first times people were saying, can we do something to whip up the immune system to go after the cancer? 
Well, if we fast forward to 2013, each year Science Magazine, one of our kind of most prestigious research magazines has what's called Breakthrough of the Year. And in 2013, it was cancer immunotherapy. And actually in 2018, five years later, uh, two people, Jim Allison in the US and a guy named Tatsuko Honjo in Japan, won the Nobel Prize for their work on immuno, cancer immunotherapy and understanding this, I, I shouldn't say cancer immunotherapy, but understanding what we're gonna talk about, what are called these checkpoints and how we can use these therapies. So what I'm gonna do is geek out a little bit and go back and um, tr try to give you my overview of the immune system and then how we harness the immune system for cancer therapy and then hone in on um, these, uh, these targeted therapies that mostly look at these checkpoints. But I wanna show you that there's other therapies that are being worked on. So the first thing we do is we look at the cells of the immune system. And one thing sort of neat about the immune system is you know, we all start from these what are called pluripotent cells. These cells can be turned into anything. And then as, as the embryo grows, they get turned into bone, hair, thyroid, whatever, you know, they get turned into things. In the adult human, in our bone marrow, we have these what are called hematopoietic stem cells because we need to keep renewing the, our, our uh, blood system. Um, and so these things just keep self-renewing. They're kind of these progenitor cells. And they can go to two different pathways, one called the myeloid pathway and another called the lymphoid pathway. I won't talk as much about the myeloid pathway because it makes things like what are called neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils. These kind of do some more um, immediate reactions. Um, and eosinophils are one of the big problems with allergic reactions, um, as basophils are too. But they also make platelets for blood clotting and erythrocytes, which are red blood cells. So they're very important, obviously, for this um, in this pathway. But what I want to do is focus a little bit more on this what's called lymphoid pathway, because that's where the, some of these therapies are now coming out. These lymphoid progenitors can make what are called natural killer cells, part of an early warning system, and then also T cells and B cells. And these guys work together to basically have our memory. And so what we do is we call these two arms of the immune system, the, either the innate immunity, which means they just sense danger and they go after it and try to fix it. They're not very specific. They're just early warning system and go after things. And then what's called adaptive immunity. These cells are the memory. So these are when we get our influenza or our COVID vaccine or measles vaccine, these guys, especially the T cells, remember. And we have these memory cells that can kind of remember what's going on and they can go after it. And they can help go after cancer cells as well. And with the T cells, we have what are called helper cells. They kind of help the system, you know, remember and, and uh, fight something. And then the cytotoxic cells. So those basically, what they mean is, is they're the one, kind of the killer cells um, in, this, in this thing. So I'll talk a little bit more as I go along about this. But this is the basics of our immune system. Actually, the other cell I'll mention, both sides, is the dendritic cell. This cell is one of the cells that presents little pieces of protein called antigens, like the vaccines or like antigens from our cancer cells. And so the immune system, if you have a mutated antigen from a cancer cell, sometimes your immune system can go after that. The dendritic cells help present that to the B and T cells. So what, out of this kind of gamish, what types of therapies are people working on? Um, so in what I call broadly immunotherapy and cancer, I start here with what are called cytokines. And so these are proteins that are secreted from the immune system and can be secreted from other cells that are secreted into the environment to sort of either whip up or whip down the immune system to kind of work or well better or not. So we're, some people are using these to inject these cytokines to hopefully help whip up the immune system uh, to kill cancers. Vaccines, as I showed you, Dr. Coley's um, vaccine was one of the first immunotherapies in vaccines. And people have tried for years to grind up tumor and then inject it back in with some other goodies that make the immune system whipped up to try to kill the cancer. For the most part, that doesn't work very well because it's a complicated immune system. But vaccines are starting to come back into our armamentarium together with other therapies. Those dendritic cells, you'll take them out of a person and basically expose them to those antigens, like those cancer antigens, and, and get them mad <laughs> and expand them and then put them back in. And they help present that and help whip up the immune system. I won't talk so much about the myeloid cells, and I'm going to talk mostly now about the T cells and different ways we can 
use the T cells because those are the ones that are very specific. They are very, very specific for certain types of proteins called antigens. Um, and we're hoping tumor antigens. So again, what happens with these T cells is they can have a basically what's called a naive T cell and it sees that what's called antigen. So this is what's called a T cell receptor, this TCR. And this again, dendritic cell, which is an antigen presenting cell. This little green thing is an antigen. It has these molecules on here and basically can push the T cell in various directions, depending upon that environment, on whether it's pro-tumor or anti-tumor. And so one of the problems we have is our, the, our system in the cancer seems to have co-opted and sometimes use the immune system to basically help the tumor grow even more. Um, and that, I won't go into that, but that's where those myeloid cells come back in. It's really a complicated system, but I'm going to simplify it down to the T cells because that's what most of our therapies are. So the, again, the T cell based therapies we can think about is vaccine here on the right. Again, we inject say little proteins, just like we do with the flu vaccine or the COVID vaccine. And hopefully these were things that are, we'd be against instead of a virus would be against the cancer cells. And then our cells, these are the dendritic cells maybe, and the, then the T cells, they present this, whip up the T cells, and then they can basically go after and kill the tumor, anti-tumor immunity. We can also do something called cell transfer therapy where we take the T cells out of somebody and either engineer them, something called CAR T cells, which is working very well in things like leukemia, uh, bloodborne cancers, not quite so well yet in solid tumors like thyroid cancer, but people are working on that. And I think we'll get there eventually um, with that, but you can do that or even just take out the person's cells from their tumor because the T cells in the tumor probably are doing something. They're maybe not fully effective, but they're doing something. And then you can basically grow those up, maybe stimulate them a little bit and put their own cells back into them to hopefully fight the tumor. And that's called TIL therapy, uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocyte therapy. Then the most common one, and what I'll spend the rest of the time talking about, is the immune checkpoint therapy. Um, and that I think I'll have a little bit more on that on the next slide. The only other thing I'll say is some people are starting to bring back things like radiation and what's called cytotoxic chemotherapy that just basically kills fast dividing cells. Because when cells die, they can kind of present antigens to the immune system. And so these therapies can do, be put in together with these checkpoint therapies um, to, to, to work together uh, to, to basically try to completely eradicate the tumor. Instead of just beating it back, if you can get the immune system mad and remembering, hopefully it can just clear the cancer is what our goal is. So these checkpoints, what is a checkpoint? So this cartoon kind of tells us a little bit, this is a T cell here on the left-hand side. And basically either one of those presenting antigen presenting cells like a dendritic cell or a tumor cell itself can do this has this what's called major histocompatibility, MHC, and then it loads it with an antigen. Let's say it's a BRAF V600E as an antigen, um, or even a thyroid specific antigen like thyroid peroxidase or thyroglobulin, a piece of that. And the T cell receptor again is very specific and can recognize that on that T cell. And then it has a co-stimulatory molecule that it needs to really uh, crank on the T cell. And the T cell now is activated and angry and fighting. As it does that, it turns on other proteins. This one we're gonna talk a little bit more about called program death one, PD1. And then another one called CTLA4 that's being used more in things like melanoma. We're not using it as much in thyroid cancer. So it turns these on so it can kind of quiet back down once it's done its job. That's the typical way it's used. If it sees an infection, it whips up the immune system and then quiets it back down once it's clearing the infection. In certain people who have chronic viral infections, or in our case, cancers, these cells can kind of prematurely get quieted down and what's called exhausted. The cells just stop functioning. They're just not, they're not dead. They're there, but they're just not functioning. And the term for that is exhausted. So these cells become exhausted. So how can we break that exhaustion? We use these antibodies, which are the checkpoint inhibitors. So we can use antibodies. So this is an IV infusion that are against PD-1 or against CTLA-4. And I won't talk any more about that because again, that's not used as much in thyroid cancer. Or we can even do it against PDL1, the other guy. But so we just want to break this thing. Now I'll tell you as a spoiler alert, in many things, this alone may not be enough. Um, we may be, we may have to do more. There are more than these checkpoints. There are other things we have to do. But this is again, I think a good therapy in partnership with other therapies. 
So how good does it work in cancer? I'll start with melanoma since this has a, been a home run in a lot of patients with melanoma. This is called lambrolizumab. I don't know why, but the company then changed the name from lambrolizumab to pembrolizumab. So that's the pembrolizumab we know about. Um, and this just shows an example of a patient who has, I'll start on the bottom here, this huge tumor in their liver. This is their liver here, this gray, but this darker area is a massive tumor in their liver. Up here in their chest, these are the lungs in black. There's some fluid called a pleural effusion in the back here and a massive tumor on the, on the left-hand side of their lung. And then this just was a biopsy. These little brown things are these cytotoxic T cells that should be killing the tumor. There are some of them, but they're just not that active and there aren't that many of them. When they got treated for 90 days, three months, this tumor, this big tumor shrank way back. This liver tumor shrank way back. And the cancer now has a bunch of those cytotoxic T cells in it. So it's basically revived the immune system. And again, I don't know if you've seen, at least if you saw my previous talk, this is again what a waterfall plot is. Some people have shown you this. This is basically each bar is an individual patient who got treated. Um, and then if it goes up, it means the tumor grew, even despite treatment. So that's not good. If it goes down, that's good. It shrinks. And you can see there's a handful of people here where it shrunk 100%. It went away. And I'll give our, I don't know which number president he was, Jimmy Carter. Um, he at age 90 had melanoma and it went to his brain and he was treated with these therapies. And so far that we know he's been cured. I mean, so it really does work for some patients and melanoma patients. So this is where it's had its biggest positive effect is in melanoma. And then I'll just segue this into thyroid now so I can finish up with thyroid and then answer your questions is um, if you look at the side effects, we can talk about side effects as we go along too. Um, again, as I said in my previous talk, you can see here there's what's called any grade because uh, there's grade one, two, three, four, five. Five you don't want because that means the person died. Uh, three means you got to stop the drug and sometimes stop it indefinitely. Four means they have to go to the hospital and you have to stop the drug. So it's, these are pretty bad side effects. Um, I'll, let's look here because this is the way we use it now, this pembrolizumab every three weeks. So most people had some symptoms, but most of them were mild. And only about 17% had these grade three, four. Just as a reference, lenvatinib, one of the drugs we use most commonly, 70% of patients have grade three or four. Um, but there you can adjust the dose. Here you can't so much. And then what I want to do is go down, typically fatigue, itchiness, diarrhea, that's a bad one if they have it. Because sometimes it can affect the colon and the immune system attacks the colon and you get terrible diarrhea. And that could be life-threatening. Rash, joint aches, nausea. And look here at the bottom, hypothyroidism. So what it does is it unleashes the immune system so it attacks the thyroid. And that's what we call Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Those T cells are now going into the thyroid. And for some reason, the thyroid is very immunogenic. It's, it's an organ that a lot of times, you know, it, it, many women as they age and men too, but even more women than men get this Hashimoto's or hypothyroidism. And so many of us thought we could use this to our advantage to go after the cancer cells. Let's get Hashimoto's against the cancer cells. A second piece of information that was fascinating with these studies, and this is just one of many, this is patients who had what's called a lung, non-small cell lung cancer. They got treated with this pembrolizumab, and then they broke them into two groups. One's in blue who their thyroid didn't go abnormal, didn't get hypothyroid. And then the other group did, so it attacked their thyroid. And you think about it, if in attacking their thyroid, maybe it attacks their cancer better too. And this showed that they survived better. So the average, and this is overall survival, living. And again, in this lung cancer, it's pretty short. But the ones who didn't have a response, they all got pembrolizumab, um, only lived for 14 months or an, on average. And the ones who did get it lived for 40 on average. So, so it was telling us there's something about the immune system. So we got pretty fascinated in using these drugs in thyroid cancer. And I'll just show you one example of just straight up using pembrolizumab in thyroid cancer. And this is just last year from the Journal of Clinical Oncology, where this group looked at people with anaplastic thyroid cancer. So the bad one, the worst one. Um, and you can see this is, again, I like this because it tells us a number of things. Um, this is what's called a swim plot or a swim lane plot. Each bar is an individual patient. And this is over time from when they started getting treated. They get IV infusions every three weeks of pembrolizumab. 
Um, and what you can see first here is you can see some people like this patient number nine here, they've gone out over two years, anaplastic thyroid cancer, one drug, pembrolizumab. They've gone out over two years and still have this little red triangle, which is what's called a partial response, so shrunk by 30% or more. And the arrow going forward means that when they published the paper, they were still on medication. They're still deriving a benefit. So there's a handful of people up here who benefit very well, but you can see there's actually a fair number of people who just don't. And this is the average time on drug was only two months. So there are people who just didn't derive a benefit at all, and some people who derived a tremendous benefit. And where we and others are researching in the field with our patient specimens is to say, can we tell who's going to get the best response or not? Because you sure would like to say, I'm going to give these folks the medicine. That's going to work. These folks is not going to work. Um, and so we're trying to figure out ahead of time. And this just shows one example we use is that PDL1. Remember that's on the tumor cell and the myeloid cells. If they have a low level of PDL1, you'd think, well, maybe it doesn't work so well. And look at a lot of the blue ones are down here. But here's somebody with a blue one way up here who had a great response. So we, it's not a perfect test yet. We may have to have a combination of tests that are going to tell us um, what the best test is for these people. So what Dr. Jenna French, a tumor immunologist here at the University of Colorado and I did a while ago was said, let's think about our therapy lenvatinib and maybe pairing it to, to, to have a two drug therapy against cancer. Um, and so we know, as I just told you, that when you do have this PDL1, PD1, now you've got this immune suppressive environment or exhausted T cells. And if we use the antibody therapy, <coughs> we break that. And then hopefully we'll get some good response. Now, what I'll say, and I'm not going to show the study, there was a small study that looked at this in more differentiated thyroid cancer. And as a single agent, it doesn't seem to be very effective. And there are a number of reasons it could be but we don't think this is gonna be a good single agent for people with differentiated thyroid cancer. It needs to be paired with something. And so we said, let's pair it with one of those multi-kinase inhibitors. The most commonly used one now is lenvatinib. Actually, we started writing this protocol so long ago, it was serafinib we wrote into it because lenvatinib had not yet been approved. And so then we moved it to lenvatinib because maybe we can kill the cancer with lenvatinib. And also there's some evidence that lenvatinib might affect that immune suppressive system. So what I'll kind of finish up with is a clinical trial that we did, and we're writing the clinical trial up now. Um, this is together with this Dr. Jenna French, the tumor immunologist PhD that I work with. I always tell people I'm an MD PhD because I'm an MD who works with PhDs. And this is Dr. Lori Wirth at Mass General. She's one of our co-PIs as well of this study. And these are the six sites in the US that, are do that have done this study. And so what we did was took people who had progressive growing tumor, this is this RESIST, um, and I don't know if you've heard a lot about it, but I'm sure the patients who've gotten CAT scans and things like that have heard more. This is a way we radiologically tell if a tumor's grown enough that they maybe weren't therapy. And so within 14 months, if they grew enough, we put them either what's called lenvatinib naive. They hadn't seen any of these kinase inhibitors yet. They got combination lenvatinib and this pembrolizumab, which is that checkpoint inhibitor. They got this every three weeks, IV, and this one orally. Dr. Wirth suggested, which was really kind of neat, I didn't think this would be a good idea, but I'm just a simple endocrinologist, um, is the second cohort was not a comparator group, was people who are already on lenvatinib. And so they're tolerating it, but now the tumor's growing, they're progressing. And we know that happens eventually in most of the patients. Fortunately for a lot of patients, they could be on it for years and it's safe. Um, but then instead of stopping the lenvatinib, because you say it's not working anymore, we added the pembrolizumab to see if the two could work together better than just the lenvatinib on its own or the pembrolizumab on its own. And so we got 30 patients in this group and 27 patients in this group. This group, we're looking for tumor to go away called a complete response. And this one, we're just looking for it to shrink. So what I show here is what's called progression-free survival. So this is the whole group in cohort one. These are the ones who had not gotten any treatment, lenvatinib or any other treatment before this. And they got combination therapy. And this looks pretty good. Meaning over time, we haven't even hit the 50% mark yet. More than uh, as far as 50% of the patients now progressed. Even way out here at 18 months, 63% of the patients were still deriving a benefit. This study didn't though compare with lenvatinib alone. So the best thing we have is just to look back at the big paper that got lenvatinib approved. And here is the various points at uh, six, 12 and 18 months. So it looks like it is the combination is better, 
The question is, is, is this significantly clinically better to be a combination for the whole group? Is that better for the whole group? And the answer may be no. It may not be just a whole group effect where instead of giving people lenvatinib, we give everybody lenvatinib plus pembrolizumab. But if we look at the individual patients, we again see these groups of people, these people who've derived a benefit for two years or more. And these people who really didn't know, we got like three to six months. And so what we're trying to do now is study the patient's blood and tissue to say, are there things that we can look at together that can tell us the difference between this group and this group? And maybe ahead of time, we can say, oh, you should just be on lenvatinib alone versus you should be on combination therapy. So that's kind of what we're doing as we're writing the paper. We're trying to figure this out on who these guys are and who these guys are so we can know who better to tailor the therapy to. Per precision medicine is what we're trying to do. Interestingly, cohort two, remember, these are folks who are growing on lenvatinib, and all we did was add pembrolizumab to them. And they, again, did progress, 50% progression at about 11 months. But again, a number of patients did seem to derive a benefit. 30% of people were still on drugs 18 months later. These are people who are growing on lenvatinib. So who are they individually? Same thing. There's a lot of folks here who seem to really benefit. 12 years, I mean, I'm sorry, 12 months, 24 months, so one in two years, some are still on therapy. Um, and we wanna understand who these folks are versus these folks. Then you could ask the question, do I keep somebody on lenvatinib and add pembrolizumab? Do I switch them to something like cabozantinib, which now is approved as what's called a second line, or I'm sorry, it's not approved, it's been shown in a good study to be a good second line drug to lenvatinib. So this is kind of where we are with those immune therapies. Um, so what I would say is, does it work in thyroid cancer? Don't know yet. And I don't think it's going to work for everybody. Thyroid cancer is a low mutation burden tumor. Um, that's one of the other markers in some cancers. If you have lots of mutations, they, they're what are called more antigens potentially, and they respond better to these. Melanoma has tons of mutations. Lung cancer has tons of mutations. But again, weirdly enough, colon cancer has lots of mutations and doesn't respond as well to these. So we, there's more that we need to understand. Um, on these. So I think there will be some patients who clearly will benefit from these therapies. And maybe those anaplastic patients will be some of our first patients that really will look at combination therapies to see, but we are continuing to kind of, kind of work on that. And so what I'll do is leave you with acknowledgements, all my colleagues, especially Dr. French, I wouldn't have done this study if it wasn't for Dr. French kind of doing her work um, on this. And then this um, International Thyroid Oncology Group, they helped us with the study. Um, the two companies, uh, ASI and Merck, helped uh, support this study um, through the multi-center trial group that we did. Um, and again, I think, I think there's a promising future for these. We just have to understand who best can use these. So that's what I mainly wanted to talk about. I guess I'll go to the Q&A. Is that all right, Angelie and Abby? Um, yeah, that's perfect. Um, yeah. Do you want us to... You want to just go ahead and dive in or yeah. you want us to read yeah. them? Okay, perfect. Yeah, I'll read through them. Um, awesome. So the first question was, is immunotherapy with pembrolizumab recommended for radioiodine or refractory papillary thyroid cancer with high tumor mutation burden, but no cancer-specific gene mutations? That was the first part of that question. Mm -hmm. Simple answer is yes. If somebody is radioiodine refractory and has a high tumor mutation burden, what that means is at least the definition and the approval is greater than 10 mutations per million bases or megabase. Um, if you have that, um, it's approved in any solid tumor, including papillary, follicular, medullary, herthal, any. Downside, even in anaplastic, a small subset of those patients have high tumor mutation burdens. As I said, thyroid cancer, even anaplastic, which just amazes me as aggressive as it is, is not a high tumor mutation a burden cancer for the most part. But there are some people who do. So we check that um, in our patients when we're looking for these specific therapies, like I talked about in my last talk. What are the side effects of the treatment? Again, it's overall pretty well tolerated. People can get fatigue, can get rash, can get some of those typical things. The ones we worry most about are when it starts attacking other organs. And some of the other organs it attacks is the, is the small bowel and colon, so people can get severe diarrhea, which can be life-threatening. 
It can cause inflammation of the lungs, a pneumonitis. That can be pretty bad too. Luckily, they're rare, but they can be bad and they're treatable in many patients. It can cause inflammation of the heart. It can cause inflammation of many organs. Um, actually, other endocrine organs like the pituitary or the adrenal gland as well. So we have to kind of monitor for that. Uh, do the potential benefits justify the side effects? Well, that's the perfect question about um, <coughs> what we always weigh in patients to say, do we think you're gonna derive enough of a benefit that it's worth the risk of the side effects? Um, and some patients will say, no, you know, your tumor is not giving you problems right now. It's growing very slowly or not growing at all. Uh, let's sit tight um, because if we give it to you, we could, we could cause problems. So great question. Follicul follicular Herthel cell cancer, radioiodine resistant, currently stable, PDL1 is 95%, but I think it was called microsatellite instability is lower, what they call microsatellite stable. Uh, doctors say immunotherapy will not work because of the MSI, but others say it will. They're probably saying it will because that PDL1 is highly expressed. But as I showed you in the anaplastic study, and in our study, I didn't show you the data, but we looked at that, and PDL1 amount didn't seem to predict who responded better than who didn't. So, so far, it's not approved for high PDL1. It is something that people can consider. And some doctors can actually push insurance companies to get it covered for some patients. So, it's something you can talk about um, with your doctor, but it's not automatically FDA approved. Uh, can you comment on the tumor mutational burden? Do you believe that if it is high despite PDL1%? score. Someone with poorly differentiated thyroid cancer can respond. Again, I think of all these things, tumor mutation burden may be one of the best. I think it's going to be a combination. We're even doing, you can even do what's called an immune signature. That may be another. Dr. French has been doing work on that, and it looks like that could be another predictor. But I think the tumor mutation burden, if it's high and there's not any other reasonable options, it's FDA approved. I think it's worth trying um, for that. What is the data for using PEMBRO in poorly differentiated thyroid cancer? Yeah, I mentioned that um, very small study. Um, and actually what they did in that small study was looked at PEMBRO plus lenvatinib in poorly differentiated nanoplastic. But it was only eight patients. Six of them did have poorly differentiated thyroid cancer and a few of them had good responses, but it wasn't across the board, fantastic response. So I think we still have to learn more. But if I have a patient with poorly differentiated and there are not mutations where I can use some of these other approved drugs and they do have a high mutation burden, I'll try it. You know, and then the other thing, you always wanna to talk to your uh, oncologist or endocrinologist, whoever your provider is taking care of the thyroid cancer is are there clinical trials available? Um, because that's what we need to do is get people into some of these clinical trials. And I know like a, there's a clinical trial using pembrolizumab plus a BRAF and a MEK inhibitor in people with advanced thyroid cancer. And I believe that's starting to getting ready to open an MD Anderson. Um, so always look for clinical trials too, before using something off label. See if, because then, then we, you're under a more a safety watch and things as you do it. And, you know, it helps us better understand, you know, who's going to respond and, and, and which drugs we should use. Uh, what size of nodule tumor mass is immunotherapy recommended? Yeah, again, a good question, because with a lot of these therapies, there is some evidence that maybe a lower tumor mutation burden might respond better. Um, I don't know if that's been in thyroid. I don't think it's been shown with these immunotherapies that you know, the tumor mutation burden is going to predict. But you, in theory, you'd think if it's a little bit lower, um, you might get a better response. There is some evidence with some of these kinase inhibitors that that may be true. So we're always weighing. When do you pull the trigger and do the medication? Because again, these medications for the most part are given uh, indefinitely, as long as the person uh, uh, tolerates it and is deriving a benefit. So it's to pull the trigger and put somebody on one of these therapies, it, it is a long-term commitment. Um, so there isn't any absolute size uh, that we do have. How does prior beam radiation affect, uh, affect effectivity in these drugs, if at all? At least again in thyroid cancer, my simple answer is I don't know. I know other people are looking in things like lung cancer. Um, I don't know about melanoma, maybe colon cancer and trying to pair radiation with immunotherapy. Because again, the, immu the radiation, what it's gonna do is 
not only kill the tumor, but then bust up the tumor and dump out a bunch of these potential antigens. So the theory is, is that those two could work better together um, with these, um, but it's not, again, been extensively proven in studies. So that's why people are doing clinical trials with the combinations. What is the PDL 1% or this score that responds better in the trial in either of the two cohorts? Well, what we did was used a cut point of 1%. That's what most studies use. You saw the study I showed you in the anaplastic showed three groups, less than 1%, 1 to 50, and greater than 50. Most studies that look at this will use a cut point of this 1%. Um, and then the MPS score um, is, I think it may be 20 as a cut point that we use for that score. Um, so that's what we've used for the cohorts. And when we've done survive, you know, progression-free survival analyses, we haven't seen a big difference in the low versus the higher expressing uh, PDL1. So, so far in thyroid, we don't think there is. Are there trials <laughs> in medullary thyroid cancer for this therapy? There have been some. Actually, interestingly, medullary, that, that's where people have done some of the vaccine therapies as well, especially using things like what's called CEA, you know, one of the tumor markers or calcitonin. Um, so I think there are people are working on some combination therapies, maybe even some of these adoptive T-cell therapies in medullary. Um, I haven't seen trials where they're just using something like pembrolizumab in medullary. Again, if you look at medullary, most of them are low mutation burden tumors. Uh, we added pembrolizumab to lenvatinib. Is there any evidence that combo of pembrolizumab and dabrafenib might show similar results? You're thinking right along the lines that a lot of other people are and that there is a study at MD Anderson where they're actually using dabrafenib plus trametinib. So dabrafenib is the BRAF inhibitor and trametinib is the MEK inhibitor and then adding pembrolizumab. And I think that's a reasonable, we even, we have mouse models. I know that sounds cruel. We give mice cancer and then we uh, try to treat it. And so we, we're, we're using some of, looking at some of those novel or more novel combinations in some of these mouse studies before we uh, subject a ton of people to those. We wanna see if they work in mice first. Uh, someone didn't understand so much, but excited, oh, that, <laughs> that I seem to understand it and are excited about it. Well, good, good. Yes, I think I partially understand it and I am excited about it. So it's, thank you for, thank you for your confidence. Uh, clarify definition of what a low mutation cancer is. Yeah, again, for FDA approval, it's 10 mutations per megabase, which is a million bases. That's the definition. And so you look at the tumor and then they can sequence the tumor. And then one of the things they can get from that, they look at all these mutations that are known mutations in cancer and say, how many do we have per million bases? And if it's above 10, uh, you can, it's FDA approved for solid cancers, including thyroid cancer. Uh, when is it expected to have FDA approval for this indication? Well, for this combination therapy and thyroid cancer, not anytime soon, because I don't think we've shown that it's just a home run better than lenvatinib alone. I think more exciting is maybe adding it on, but what before we would want to try to get, and I don't, the problem, here's a good, I'll take a step back actually, um, because there's a big difference between FDA approval and um, getting into guidelines. For the FDA to approve a drug combination like this, we probably would have to do a big study with say 200, 300, 400 patients. The big question always comes is you can't, we, we get funding from the federal government, say the NIH, they're not gonna pay for study like that. The people who pay for a lot of those big studies are the industry groups that, that are interested in saying, hey, let's find, you know, try to treat more people with these drugs. Right now, we wouldn't be able to convince these companies based on this to do one of those big trials. So I don't think we'd be able to get FDA approval, but what you can do with some of these trials is if it looks promising enough in a small trial is get guidelines to say, we should be using these, like the NCCN or the American Thyroid Association guidelines. So sometimes what we do is if we have very promising results in a small study like this, the people who write the guidelines read these trials and say, hey, we think this is something that, that should be used. And then sometimes insurance companies based on those guidelines will cover it. So that's another way to get it covered that doesn't require FDA approval, which is a really long process. Anything that can be done to improve response to targeted therapies or immune therapy, oh, diet, lifestyle, et cetera? What a great question. So the answer I would say is probably, but we just don't know yet. We 
that's a whole nother layer of, you know, if you say, okay, I'm going to put you on a Mediterranean diet or a, you know, a Atkins diet or this diet or that. I mean, we have enough trouble just doing it in people who are trying to lose weight, let alone doing it with therapies. But we strongly believe that there probably is something. So what I tell all my patients in the meantime is really eat a good diet, probably a Mediterranean style diet where your fats are monounsaturated, lots of fruits and vegetables of different colors because that's antioxidants. Um, you know, cut up, cut down as much as you can, simple sugars, things like that. Get good sleep. What do I mean by that? At least seven hours, preferably eight hours, um, and get good physical activity. Then you're helping your immune system by doing those three things, but we don't have perfect studies yet. We, again, because we can do more in mice, we're doing some of those studies in mice. We actually make mice overweight and then give them the thyroid cancer and see if their thyroid cancer behaves more badly. Um, than ones who don't. That's our hypothesis, but we, we want it. So we're, we, in my lab, we're doing it more in mice rather than trying to torture a whole bunch of people in these studies yet. So that's the way we're doing it. But very good question about diet and lifestyle. Uh, anaplastic thyroid cancer with BRAF on this uh, atazolizumab, atazol, which is a PDL1 inhibitor. Um, disease progression, would you recommend changing to Pembro? Wow. That's a tough question. Um, I would, I, again, and I don't know if this trial has anaplastic patients, uh, but maybe the trial that uses Pembro plus combination. Um, and again, I, I, with ATC with BRAF, the one thing I would say, hopefully this person has already been treated with a BRAF inhibitor, the combination of BRAF MEK inhibitor. Um, but I think this, actually the trial at MD Anderson might be anaplastic. Um, so you might wanna look at that on the um, clinicaltrials.gov website, just punch in anaplastic thyroid cancer. There aren't a billion studies. I think this study may be in there and it might be a combination of pembrolizumab plus BRAF and MEK inhibitor. That might be a good thing to consider as a clinical trial. But again, all three drugs are approved for other cancers and the two drugs are approved for anaplastic. So sometimes you can get approval for those, but my recommendation would be is to get on a clinical trial if you could. Um, I know sometimes that can be very hard. How about a CTLA-4 combo? That's the combination with the CTLA-4 inhibitor and the PD-1 inhibitor um, has been used probably most effectively in, in uh, melanoma, but um, that uh, hasn't really been used much in thyroid cancer. One problem is, is now you're using these two different checkpoints and they have kind of different uh, side effect profiles and sometimes can have higher levels of side effects because you're hitting two of these pathways. I'm in these patients. Uh, so it, it hasn't been really used um, a lot. Is there concern that if immunotherapy doesn't work, it could delay needed treatment that will work? Oh, yeah. I mean, again, I, I guess I'll use the example of if you have a tumor that's radioiodine refractory growing and somebody sequences it and says, oh, you've got a RET mutation and you've got high tumor burden. I would probably recommend leaning toward the RET inhibitor first, um, just because again of the side effect profile and the efficacy that we've seen so far. Uh, there still is some questions, even though tumor mutation burden is a good predictor, I would go with the little bit more tried and true and tested in thyroid cancer, RET inhibitor or NTRAC inhibitor, and then consider the um, immune therapy. In my mind, I don't think trying the immune therapy first, and then if they progress, if you progress that trying the other one would like you've lost something? I don't think so, but we've not studied it, so I don't know. Is cancer caused by an immune response or other factors? Wow, you guys have good questions. Um, simple answer is don't know for sure. My, our belief is it's a combination probably of a person's genetics. Now, this doesn't mean mutations. This means what you inherited from your parents and the environment. There's a combination there, we don't know it quite yet, that leads to things like these mutations. The immune system has been shown in things like the colon cancer, prostate cancer, and I believe breast cancer kind of irritates the cells in those tissues to potentially cause cancers. People with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, it's mixed data, but there is, I believe when I look at all of it, there is a little bit increased risk of papillary thyroid cancer in people who have Hashimoto's. So the immune system, what it does is it really whips everything up in there and probably you know, can cause some cells to start dividing faster and maybe get mutations. 
Um, so the immune system could be playing a role. In thyroid, I also though believe it is playing a role if you have a whipped up immune system like Hashimoto's, it plays a role in keeping the cancer from getting too aggressive and spreading. We, we and others have shown that data. So it's kind of a double-edged sword with the immune system. Dendum, PDL 150%. I think maybe is that still the person who was asking the question about uh, getting um, this getting this therapy based on a PDL one of fifty percent. Again, there's no it's not FDA approved based on PDL one levels. The studies show in general that probably the more PDL one you have, it might benefit. So if there aren't other options and the tumor's really growing and you need something, it's something that could be considered, but that would be off label. Just to just to let you know, you have fifteen minutes. Okay. I'll just keep going through questions until it works beautifully. Thank you. Feel free to chime in if you want to clarify anything. Oh, question. I missed the beginning. How do you find out your tumor mutation burden? Same way you find out the mutations in general. So you do it for these sequencing and some, depending upon which ones you go to, most of the big ones, big companies will do a, what's called a microsatellite stability test for instable or stable and then tumor mutation burden. So most of the big companies will do that when you're looking for BRAF mutations or RET mutations. Can pembrolizumab be administered in, iso in isolation for high tumor mutation burden, radioactive iodine, refractory PTC, or does it need to be administered only as a cocktail with other drugs? Nope, it's FDA approved as a single agent. So if you have PTC, MTC, Herthel cell, and a plat, well, I would say with anaplastic, I wouldn't use it as a single agent. Anaplastic is so aggressive. I would try it in combinations with other things, but the others, you can use it as a single agent and it's FDA approved as if you have a high tumor mutation burden. Is there a possibility of a cancer vaccine using thyroglobulin? Yeah, you say thyroglobulin antibody, but it would be thyroglobulin. If so, approximately when? People have tried using pieces of thyroglobulin or pieces of calcitonin or pieces of CEA in the different tumors. I think that question is great because obviously these new COVID vaccines, uh, especially the Pfizer and the Moderna are mRNA vaccines. So they're not DNA or protein vaccines. And there's, we may be moving to these mRNA vaccines for other things. So that's a very good thought. It hasn't been done yet. And I think people in other cancers like melanoma and lung who are ahead of us may be starting to work on that. I must admit what we do in the thyroid field is we learn a little bit from them and then we try to move what we think is useful into the thyroid field because they have, there's many more resources they have behind them to do these studies. Um, comment on tumor, tumor infiltrating cell therapy. Yeah, I left out a slide. It's a pretty complicated slide of a patient. It was just amazing what breast cancer that was all over the place. They took out her cells. They grew them up, irritated them. Again, cells from the tumor, not from the blood, took out the tumor cells. And the reason they do that is because those cells in the tumor, it's thought to be many of those cells are there for a reason. They're trying to fight the tumor. But maybe because of that exhaustion or other things, they're just, they're not enough of them and they're just not effective enough. So they took it out and then they treated the patient with pembrolizumab and put them back in once they were whipped up and expanded. And this patient had a complete response. All the tumors just shrank away. But again, like that's what's called practicing anecdotal medicine. You know, one person got a great response. Uh, the first person who had anaplastic thyroid cancer in Japan got linvatinib as a single agent, had a beautiful response. Then since then, not so many. So we want to try to figure out, but that's a good thought. And people are working on that in all sorts of cancers. I don't know if in thyroid right now, there's a ton of it. I do know some people at the NIH did it in medullary for a while, tried to do that um, and with mixed results, but I, that's coming. People are working on that. Could I please talk about studies, experiences, and the potential immunotherapies for medullary? Is there any follow-up from my team of 2020 comprehensive immune profiling study for medullary? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it was from a fellow buff. It's the Colorado Buffaloes college team. Go Buffs. Um, yeah, so we, we don't have follow-up at this point on the profiling that Dr. French did on a bunch of patients with medullary. I will say it was actually some patient advocates and one in particular who really helped move that study forward. It was amazing. Um, uh, so this is where patient advocates can really help. 
Um, we haven't yet moved that into therapeutics. Dr. French has looked at a few things. Um, again, some people are looking in medullary at combinations of vaccines and some of these immunotherapies, um, but it's in early stages. I don't have results. Can I comment on CAR T cell therapy? See, you know, there are, there are endocrinologists out there who don't know who, what CAR T cell therapy is. This is a smart bunch. Um, so again, those CAR T cells, what that stands for is chimeric antigen receptor. You take a patient's T cells out and then you do manipulation with DNA to basically give them this kind of hybrid receptor that supposedly will target some specific antigen. Now, again, in leukemias and things like that, they're, they've got like two different CARs, they call them, these CAR T cells, two different ones, and they now put them back in and are having very good effect um, in these patients. It is not as effective in solid tumors, and many of us in the thyroid field are probably waiting for some of our colleagues in, um, again, lung cancer, melanoma, to maybe you know, move the field forward a little bit more. There has been some CAR T cell therapy, I believe, again, from the NIH in thyroid cancer, but it was small studies and mixed results. So we're, we're on hold right now with the CAR T cell therapies. Does cancer start on thyroid nodules or anywhere else in the thyroid gland? Yeah, there's some debate about how thyroid cancer starts, but for the most part, what it happens is, is for some reason, because of the person's genetics and the environment, radiation, other things in the environment uh, that we don't, I mean, Dr. Julianne Sosa at UCSF and her colleagues have looked at flame retardants, of all things, that might trigger thyroid cancer. And what they probably do is trigger some sort of an environment, most likely mutations, but other things can happen too, that starts up a cancer. Um, and it's not known whether it happens in the actual adult thyroid cell or more likely in what's called that there still are a few of these really de-differentiated cells that can make new thyroid cells that may get hit. We don't know that yet, but good question. Do we believe in debulking disease helps immunotherapy respond better? Uh, sometimes some people think it does, uh, you know, taking tumor out. And again, you're sort of messing with the immune system anyway and that then you give another immune therapy. That's where radiation therapy is thought also to be helpful. It's got this very weird name that some people agree with and some people don't called the abscopal effect, meaning you radiate one tumor and it'll affect a non-radiated tumor because the immune system is now really irritated and it'll go after that. Um, and so people debate on that, but possibly doing a surgical therapy or radiation or even cytotoxic chemotherapy for a short period of time might help. Now, remember though, here's another thing that the cytotoxic chemotherapy, some of the most vulnerable to cells are the immune cells. So in a way you're kind of, you're also killing some of those immune cells. So it's a, it's a double-edged sword with those cytotoxic chemotherapies. Are all these new drugs, all these oh, new drugs or have they been used approved already for other tumors? Um, most of the ones I showed everybody, um, these PD-1 inhibitors and PDL1 inhibitors are already approved. They're fairly new still, but they're already approved. There are some other things that are not yet even approved in any um, human cancer. But the ones I talked about today are already approved in at least one tumor type, most of them in melanoma, um, but other, other cancers as well. Actually, that combination we're trying in thyroid, lenvatinib plus pembrolizumab, is approved in uterine cancer because they really had a pretty good response in uterine cancer. So it is approved, that combination is approved in uterine cancer. Certain ethnic groups that are more likely to get thyroid cancer. I bet the answer's out there, I just don't know that off the top of my head. Men, I mean, women get more thyroid cancer than men. Men's tends to be a bit more aggressive, but I don't know from ethnic groups. Um, again, the answer may be out there, I just, it's not coming into my head. Retemvo, retivmo. Boy, I only know the generic names well. Lung, liver tumors have shrunk. If somebody can type in what, or say what, I, have, I can't look up, what's the generic name for retivmo? There's so darn many of them, I just don't keep up on all the uh, <laughs> trade names. Um, but the liver tumors shrank 60% and stabilized. Should I consider ablation now while they're in hibernation? Ablation meaning of the liver lesions. That's a good thought. Something to talk to your um, kind of cancer providers about. In some people we do that, you shrink it enough to where you can use another therapy like ablation therapy, radiofrequency or alcohol ablation. 
depends on how many tumors, where they are and how big they are. But the really big tumors are hard to treat with that. So if you shrink them enough with immune therapy, um, that would be good. Uh, Dr. Haugen, uh, Retivo is selpercatinib. Oh, okay, so that's selpercatinib. Great. So that's the red inhibitor. So even with that, you could consider. I guess I had my mind in the immune therapy talk, so I was I wasn't thinking about the other drugs. Yeah. So that's the ret inhibitor selpercatinib. Um, it's definitely a conversation that would be worth having. If that's the only place you have tumor, that could be a good combination. Uh, and we have about five minutes left. Okay. And I've got a little timer up here too. So okay, thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Tempest and Garden, those are two companies that do these tests, do not do tumor mutation burden on blood. Yeah, I bet they don't because that's that you got to have probably quite a bit of DNA to do that. So you may not from blood get enough tumor DNA. Uh, do not have enough tissue to test TMB. Do you know which platform I can use to check TMB, the tumor mutation burden on the blood? I don't. You might want to look at you know some of the others, or again, talk to your medical oncologist. They may know or may know people who do. I don't off the top of my head know which of these platforms can do tumor mutation bur burden off of a blood or a liquid biopsy. Maybe none at this point, because it takes quite a bit of DNA. My mother had bowel cancer that spread to her stomach. I have thyroid nodules and kidney disease caused by, immune, caused by an immune response. Huh. What are my chances of getting thyroid cancer? Yeah, I don't know what the immune response is. Um, and the best thing with the thyroid nodules is the combination of the ultrasound and a biopsy. Um, but with having this, you know, one thing I do with some people who have, especially family members who have multiple cancers or they themselves have multiple cancers, I have them work with our uh, uh, genetic counseling folks to see if there is some sort of a familial runs in the family thing where they can do a blood test to say, do you have genes that predispose you to certain types of cancers or even other diseases? So if you have a bunch of these different things, it's like, wow, these all seem different, but we're getting them all in myself or my family. What I would recommend is that you uh, see a genetic counselor um, and they can talk to you about that and help you with that and sometimes do testing to see. Drugs from renal cell cancer often get approved in thyroid. We seem to be more similar to renal cell than melanoma. Do you know what's on the horizon for renal cell? Well, the one thing unique about renal cell, because it's not you know, super common, but it really is a vascular tumor. And that's why a lot of these multi-kinase inhibitors, like linvatinib, like a lot of these others are first tested and approved in renal cell carcinoma. So it's not that it's so much like thyroid cancer, but I think a lot of these multi-kinase inhibitors, and I don't know right off the top of my head, I don't, I don't think there's a big home run with immune therapies in renal cell carcinoma, but a lot of these multi-kinase inhibitors are approved first in renal cell carcinoma, partly because they're so vascular. That's why they're approved. So I don't know if they're necessarily a lot like thyroid. I'd have to say prostate maybe is a little closer to thyroid um, as far as behavior. Uh, thoughts on cryotherapy with immunotherapy. Well, again, it's another way of killing the tumor. We tend to reserve cryotherapy for the bones, um, but you can use it in other areas as well. Could work, but I don't know. I, I have that we have like two minutes left or should we uh, wrap up? Do you wanna, should we keep going for a few minutes or should we stop? I'd say uh, however many you want to try and get through. So I'll, I'll that time for you. probably one more question. Okay. Oh, the, what, we, what do we think is responsible to increase papillary thyroid cancer and other thyroid diseases? Oh, in people. Uh, yeah, the environment. But I don't know what in the environment <laughs> for sure. There's something in the environment, I think, that's increasing this kind of stuff. Curcumin, enhanced tumor, turmeric, help in reducing tumor mutation. Yeah, people have used it and thrown that on cancer cells and killed cancer cells, but the place I've seen it most used is in colon, where you, you can get high levels in the uh, colon, in the, in the in small intestine and colon. I don't know how you can't, it's hard to get high blood levels. Um, so I don't know if that's really effective um, in other types of cancers where it doesn't see high levels. All right, I think that's all the questions. Thank you so much. That was that was fantastic. You went through those so fast. Yeah. I appreciate Thank you, you so much. taking the time to answer everyone's questions, Dr. Haugen. My that pleasure. Was fantastic. My and, pleasure. Uh, Thank you for all the work that you all do. Thank you, and appreciate everyone's um, 
checking in here and, and, and putting your questions uh, forward and lots of folks to um, thank for that and, and, and your contributions. I also just wanted to say thank you to Jackson, who's our session yes. uh, producer behind the scenes for all of these sessions. We have someone that's been handling a lot of the tech for us. So really grateful for all of their contributions to that. And um, just, Abby, just wanted to remind people, get to the auction. Help raise some money for FICA. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that money goes to research, and the research helps to find new possible, uh, well, you know, we all want the cure, Treatments. but new possible treatment options. That's so right. definitely Fun grants. do that. And thank you again to Dr. Hagen for taking the time to yes. sit with us today. And, you bet. And thank you, Anjali and Abby. Yeah, absolutely. All right. And everyone, have a, have a have a rest of your restful Saturday, drink lots of water, yes. try and get some sleep, and we'll see you tomorrow <laughs> to wrap up our annual conference. And we're excited to for some really great talks tomorrow as well. Thank you so much. Yeah. Take Thanks. care, everyone. Be well. Bye.